time of its acquisition, Interactive Avenues had grown to about 200 employees with offices in Mumbai, Delhi and Bangalore in India. While media reports have placed the transaction value at about rupees 350 to 400 crores, Pratish is not going to confirm or deny this number. And as a transaction which involves private entities, we of course respect that privacy, being an entrepreneur myself. But the outcome nevertheless has been clearly a good one for the smiling Ratish and his co-founders and investors. The aim of this interview therefore is to cap try and capture some key elements of this successful journey. Okay, So Ratish, welcome and congratulations first and foremost on the inter-public deal. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now the main focus today is going to be on the inter-public uh, interactive avenue story. But, you know, before we jump into that, what you're currently doing, Ad Magnet, the digital ad network company that you currently head, uh, we understand that this was a spin-off from interactive avenues in 2008 and is not part of this acquisition by inter-public. What excited you so much about this ad network business that you chose to become the CEO of the spin-off? So, uh, you know, we've always wanted to launch an ad network that was uh, part of the overall plan that we had when we launched Interactive Avenues in 2006. We took some time to launch it. We had our own, you know, thesis to kind of delay the launch and so on and so forth. Now, among the five of us, we all had our given, you know, we all had our responsibilities. And, you know, Bombay was the, the largest office for Interactive Avenues and Amar was, 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 hand, was handling that. So it was kind of, you know, only just that he continues to handle the largest piece because that was the bread and butter business that we had. And, uh, you know, the, the way I look at it is maybe I was most, uh, it was easier for me to maybe move out because, they, you know, Amar was handling Bombay, Anjali was handling Delhi, Shan was handling strategy, Sunil was handling buying and buying, uh, and Lions is an important part of uh, the network. So Sunil and me moved on to start Interactive Avenues, sorry, Ad Magnet, uh, from Interactive Avenues and uh, we let Amar become the CEO because he he anyway ran that and therefore by you know he, he, he was running the largest office uh, in Interactive Avenues and it's kind of obvious that he should be the next uh, you know he, he should take on um, the agency business. Okay so now he, you know uh, sorry and, go ahead Pratish. Yeah and, and, and also maybe you know um, uh, what kind of excited uh, me to kind of start this is, is, is that you know it was maybe slightly it was a one it was different from uh, the agency business because now you're on the other side of the table you're, you're more like a publisher but with this fair amount of technology kind of thrown in and two it was something new so it was like you know the the the, the hunger of going back to you know bootstrapping and starting off uh, a new venture was more exciting than kind of running an existing venture okay now you know I'm going to rewind uh, yeah. So we're going to rewind all the way back to your education, uh, sure. and from what we understand, you know, you had a fascination for advertising right from your school days, but your very middle class, you know, uh, parents said get a real job, well, and you therefore wasn't... first became a mechanical engineer. Is that right? So it, it wasn't exactly my parents. My parents have been more or less supportive of what I've done. It's more like you know. Uh, People at large around you. I mean, my my uncles, my my, my friends, my peers said, "No, you must be joking. You want to do English honors? You want you want to get a job? <laughs> so you know, why don't you get a job first and figure out life later?" So he said, "Yeah, I mean, actually, it does make sense because you know, at that time, I'm not saying about that time, you see a lot of people who've done graduation and kind of you know, and especially coming from a small town, you see a lot of people who've done graduation and kind of floating around." He said, "Okay, no, let's not take a risk. <laughs> it's maybe too 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 big a risk to take in life at that point in time." So, I did, you know, effort in engineering, and uh, became a, a mechanical engineer for for, for the rest of the world. You said you came from a small town, you know. So give yeah. us some sense of your background over there. Oh, okay, I was born and brought up in a place called Rani Ganj. Rani Ganj is in West Bengal, and uh, it is it is known for its its coal mines. So I did my schooling from uh, till class ten from Asinsol. Uh, a school called St. Patrick's uh, High Secondary School, and then my plus two from Calcutta. Um, and um, you know, so so coming from that, you you know, from a small town at that point in time, you're always kind of slightly more wary about about what you want to do, and you want to be sure about of what you want to do next. So you know, getting into something which is more streamlined or more 
you know, um, uh, acceptable, like engineering seemed to be the right thing to do at that point in time. I mean, not that oh, I'm with I you. don't regret doing engineering. I mean, it was a, at a fantastic time. It was a great time <laughs> doing it, especially, you know, the kind of guys we had in the, in, in the mechanical department. We had a great time. So I don't regret at all doing my engineering at the end of the day. Okay, and then you know you did something pretty interesting. You went and joined a public sector undertaking for a person who was interested in advertising. Wasn't that a rather radical departure from your uh, aspiration? Well, you know, yeah, once I got into, into into engineering, kind of you know somewhere the advertising piece kind of end of the background. Although I still remember, I even in you know at that time there used to be this magazine called A and M, okay, which is quite famous for people. I mean, or or or, or widely read by people in in, in 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 advertising. So I would read that on and off. And while there was some sort of stuff, it was basically it was very clear. Okay, you're an engineer now. You better do a engineering job. And that's all there was. To the extent that I, I still remember when I was in, in you know, in my final year, people said, "I'm fine. I'm ready for an MBA." I said, "You know, you know, managers are born and not made." I said, "So <laughs> can I give to people?" And I didn't even appear for an MBA in, in my final year. And um, and I got through uh, Hindustan Copper. And I joined there. It wasn't too far off from home. And friend, like you know, I, my parents were in Ranigan, and I was in a place called Ghatshila near Jamshedpur. Um, so I could have joined that. And uh, mines are not new to me. In fact, wherever I stayed, it was much more dangerous mines, like coal mines. Not that I had to go in, but it is, you know, so kind of. So it it is fine. And um, um, the two years, I did I did learn a lot. But then you know. After two years, it was like this is long time. You better get move a move on from here. It's it's good for a short short stint, but not good for a, a, a long period of time. So then you went and escaped to an MBA in IIM Calcutta. That's right. And That's right. Uh, you know, there's you know, MBAs from any of the premier IIMs get the pick of the jobs. But you That's chose right. to join O and M, of course, a very respected ad agency. And since then. You've been an ad man now for about 18 years. What exactly right, makes right. this world of advertising? A lot of people think it's make believe. What makes it so appealing, exciting to you, Ratish? See, two things. I mean, okay, one thing. I mean, well, the primary thing was, while I had this basic interest, it 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 was waning on and off. It wasn't that you know, it was a a passion driven completely, and I've always thought about it. Now, you know, in my fifth term, we had a course called Advertising Management, which is taken by the late Professor Subhash Sengupta. Uh, he written a book on brand positioning, and he's a fantastic uh, professor, fantastic teacher. Uh, you know, we, I, I still remember. I think we had about 80 odd kids who had, or of us who were registered for the course, and uh, each class of his would have more than that. People who who were not registered would land up to attend his his lecture. The two hour lecture, there was no break. You could go out if you want, but the the class would go on. And people would not go or go out. I mean, in other classes, you would you you would try and go out, go somewhere else, smoke, come back, whatever. Here, people would sit there and, and kind of go through the entire class. It was, it was fantastic, and that's where I kind of got back to this is like interesting, you know, the way he put the entire thing forward uh, in 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 front of us. How is it? Is a, why do you create an ad? How is an ad made? You know, how, all that kind of stuff. How are brands made? So it was like really really interesting, and that kind of kind of caught. Uh, my interest back into advertising, and I said, you know, this is this is a place I'd love to love to work with. On the on the flip side, the other th the other thing also is, a, in, in advertising, typically you get posted in large cities. <laughs> B, you don't need to wear a tie. Okay? <laughs> that's and, that's and three, there are a lot of women. Huh? And three, there are a lot of women. Yeah, well, women depends on which agency and which city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, you know, uh, one very interesting, you know, Ratish, you, you seem to have always tried to experiment in some fashion or the other. So in May two, 2000, you were with Euro RSCG, again another big agency, when they decided to spin off a company called Media Turf as yes. an exclusive digital media services business with venture capital funding. What made you realize, you know, that or transition to such a internet based venture? So again, you know, um, a, a lot of stuff, maybe a experiment or just happen by itself. So I was doing fairly well at, at Euro, and uh, you know my boss was happy with me. My my, my boss was the uh, was the late uh, Mr. Ramani, um, Mr. V. Ramani, and uh, you know I I was there for three years there, and and one fine day I sent a you know my resignation to him, saying you know Ram Ramani, I'm off, I'm I am quitting. So he was. Out of the country, he'd come back and he said, "Listen, what's wrong with you? 
why are you quitting? I said, she, you know, every everybody's talking about dot com, dot com, dot com these days. I don't know what dot com is all about, but you know, I want to try my hand as a dot com thing. You know, I've, I've run advertising for some time. Not that I'm an expert, but I'd like to try this new, new thing. And I've got an offer from a company in the dot com space, so I think I'll kind of move on. So to which he said, you know, if if that's what interests you, we've got a, a stuff here. Uh, we we starting off a new digital uh, initiative, so why don't you join us? I said, what's that all about? Then he told me something. I didn't know what he was talking about in the first time. I think I've researched a bit about it on the net, and so yeah, that sounds exciting. So I said, okay, fair enough, I'm on. And so so he made me an offer, and I guess I was the second employee, second employee at, at MediaTurf, and I've kind of moved on. So it just happened the way I look at it. <laughs> Okay, so you were lucky that your interest coincided with your employer's interest at that point in time. <laughs> yeah. Then six years later, in 2006, you left MediaTurf with three of your colleagues and an ex-colleague, Anjali, you know, who had left MediaTurf earlier. What suddenly gave you the confidence that you could actually be able to work and sustain yourself as an independent team and as an independent agency? So, a um, couple of things, uh, as in, you know, uh, if you look at the team which came out, so other than our CEO then, the late Mr. Ramani. Uh, I was the CEO, Amar was head of Bombay, Anjali used to be head of Delhi, Shantanu was head of strategy, and Sunil was head of buying and alliances. So if you look at very much except the CEO, the, the, the rest of the operational team, the, the, the top team were kind of, were the five of us who kind of moved out. So A, we ran the business for, uh, or or we, we contributed to running on the business for a long time. We had fairly decent relationship with the people in the market, with publishers, with clients, with, with employees themselves, with employees in, in, in other companies. And the biggest thing was, you know, a business like this did not need too much of capital, at least for in the beginning. So it was kind of said, you know, end of the day we said, let's start it, let's see what happens. Worst case, what will happen? We'll look for a job, that's it, right? And, we'll, and I'm sure what, would, what we've done for the last six, seven years, we'll definitely get a job. So, so we said, let's take a plunge. I mean, you know, it, it's it's never too early or never too late to take a plunge. Let's just take a plunge at this point in time. And the markets were looking good at that point in time. So we said, you know, let's let's kind of do this. And um, I think we did well by doing that because we did manage to get a fair amount of business at that point in time. Did you guys give yourself, you know, an initial time period before you said you would uh, you would say it's not working, like one year, two no. years, something like that? Or were you very confident right from the word go? So I think we were fairly uh, we were fairly uh, confident that we would get business. Having said that, some of the some of the clients who we thought would move with us did not, but some who we, who we thought would not move moved us. So so it kind of evened out, and um, we didn't give ourselves. We said let let's just start. If we we'll take it as it comes, and uh, we launched on the third of April, and on the fifth of April we launched our first campaign. That was two days after we launched the business. So that gave us the confidence to, you know, say, okay, boss, let's just get around and, and do this. So now all of you five, you know, had worked together and you kind of got to know each other, if I understood you right, at uh, Euro S R S C G Media Turf. Is yeah, that, that right? Media, yes, yes. Okay, now you know, John Rockefeller had this famous comment that a friendship founded on business is better than a business founded uh, on friendship. Uh, you know, how much would you agree to something like this in the light of your own experience? So, I you what, we got along well, uh, the five of us, we got along fairly well um, in terms of, and, and our wavelengths were the same, in, in the sense that, you know, we, we have, I'm not saying we had no differences, but end of the day when it came to business one, we were quite uh, open about discussing it um, amongst ourselves even before we, we started, we would, it was not that, you know, okay, you know, I'm telling you this and we have to do this. We, we, we've always discussed and arrived at a solution. We were not just kind of, you know, friends in uh, at work. We would catch up for a drink once in a while. Um, there were times we've kind of caught up with families. So it's kind of gone beyond. I mean, we, we, we actually became pretty, pretty good friends uh, in, in that sense, going beyond just work. And we knew each other's strengths and, and we could kind of hive it off. So in, in, in some cases where, you know, I may be lacking somebody like an Amar or a Sunil would just kind of Come on and say, okay, this part let me handle. I know this, let me handle this piece. Okay, so we know we knew each other's because we 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 worked together for six years, and so we knew knew each other's strengths, we knew each other's weaknesses, and and uh, we got along well. So that was kind of you know uh, a good thing because uh, you know it's it, it therefore became a combination of a business which came out of 
friendship, but that friendship actually came out of business. So maybe it's kind of somewhere, you know, uh, both the things that they put together were kind of uh, <laughs> meshed into one. Great. You know, see, one of the things that seems to strike me is that there was clarity of purpose and there was clarity of communication at all times. That's what you seem to be telling me. Right. I mean, see, okay. end of the day, as individuals, we may always have our differences, which is possible. Anybody will have their own differences. But those were stuff which did not kind of uh, uh, derail the progress, and, and they were stuff which was always sorted over a discussion. Um, but we were very clear about what we wanted to do, and therefore all of us had the same vision there. So we, we, when you agreed on the same vision, and you could have some minor differences in the way that it didn't matter, but when your vision is the same, you know, you end up cooperating and doing or, or driving towards the same vision, and, th and that's what works for us. Okay, now one of the things that you guys did was apparently to split the equity equally, you know. How, you know, how easy or difficult was this process of splitting the equity and splitting the roles that you had and choosing, say, the first among equals? Just walk us through some of the thinking that you so, had over there. So there were five of us there, and... Um, the roles were not much different, right? I was so Amar was head of Bombay. He was head of Bombay here. Uh, Shah, Anjali was head of Delhi before she quit. She was head of Delhi here. Shantru was head of strategy. She was he was head of strategy. Sunil was head of buying and, and alliances, and and that's what he did. Okay, I was a CEO there. They just so I my O changed to me, and I became a CEO. That's about it. So there was technically no not much of change in in our roles, so to say, except that. You know, now we didn't have to go uh, over us to talk to somebody and say take permission to do something or 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 get a permission for a particular spend. We were the ones who decided what to do. So in that case, you maybe we were more empowered in that sense. And so the role there was not too much of a role change. A eh? and you know we we've, we've all we've been on an equal footing in our earlier this thing also. I mean maybe I was a CEO or whatever else, but you know people ran the business the way they were looking. We we were quite fluid in the way we we ran the business. So kind of, you know, uh, the equity amongst all of us was not actually an issue at all. It was just simple. We decided, okay, fine, this is what we're going to do. And that actually maybe saved a lot of um, time and effort, which would have maybe otherwise gone and haggling and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, for us, it didn't matter. Day one, we just started. We, we, we rolled. We knew this was what was going to happen. And therefore, there was no issue. I mean, so we didn't spend a lot of time in, let's say, wasteful discussions and kind of back and forth and a lot of stuff, which I guess some people might be um, spending. So in that case, we 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 got on to work very fast. So, you know, would this be something, you know, Ratesh, that you would recommend to uh, other entrepreneurial teams? Would this be something that you would replicate in any other venture you might be starting in the near future I or think, later? You know, I think it worked, and I think it's a it's a it's a good thing. So, for example, I mean, if there are three of uh, three people just starting something together, okay, I would think that you know. It could be good well, unless somebody is, of course, bringing in uh, a whole extra amount of um, honey. I mean, they, if the other two people, I see, let's say all of them are bringing in wet equity, an equal amount of cash, and it should be kind of equal amongst everybody, right? Unless, of course, somebody is going to bring in a whole lot of extra cash, and of course, you should give them the benefit of, of that piece. Otherwise, everything being equal, it doesn't matter whether you were junior or senior earlier. I mean, you, you've come into it together, you've come in as equals, so therefore everything should be equal, is what we, is, is what I think and what all of us thought. Great. Now, when did you suddenly realize that you needed more money and uh, you got Shadi.com founder Anupam Mittal as, a, as an angel investor for Interactive Avenues. So right. when did you realize that you needed money and how did you end up pitching to somebody like him? So we knew Anupam um, earlier. In fact, he was a client and uh, both Amar and me have met him a couple of times. Uh, and once we started, uh, you know, we said, yeah, sooner or later we will need some money because in the advertising piece, you know, there is a need for working capital, right? I mean, a lot of advertisers do not pay on time and you need to pay the publishers, you need to pay salaries. More important than that, you need to pay salaries in 30 days' time, right? When you started and, and money comes in at best if you're lucky in 60 days, more or less, more like 75, 90 days kind of stuff. So, uh, A, of course, we realize that we need to raise some money sooner than later. Not very large amounts, but we need to raise some money. And um, we thought, you know, a faster thing is maybe to go to an individual or an angel kind of a person rather than go to an organization. And um, so somebody had, uh, somebody said, why don't you have a chat with Anupam? I said, fair enough, why don't you fix up a meeting with me? So this person fixed up a meeting. We went down, we met him. He seemed interested. He said, yeah, this looks good and I'd like to invest. You tell me what it takes. 
and uh, um, and then we discussed the term Ganesh and it worked out and it worked out very fast and and all in all a, a good decision I think in terms of the support and he took a decision extremely fast so we were happy about it. So you know one of the things that you seem to have done so far Ratish from the early part of your entrepreneurial journey is working with people you knew quite well you know uh, you got them as co-founders or in the in Anupam's case as an investor mm -hmm. you think this this helped you cut down a lot of you know otherwise what the pain that otherwise a lot of entrepreneurs typically I, go through I think so I think so so to the extent one you know as co-founders we we worked together so for each of us we didn't even have to sit and figure out what we were doing we knew what what we were you know we knew each other very well. A eh? uh, getting to Anupam wasn't very difficult. A eh? we knew him, and somebody has introduced him. And luckily for us, he was also interested in the space. Okay. Um, third thing that maybe worked for us is, uh, you know, good or bad. Uh, I mean, good for us at least is uh, a fair number of employees at, at Mediator were willing to move with us. So as you said again, people, you know, with with people. Or, or, or entities we knew it, it, it was easier. So we had a team of another 25 people who kind of moved with us from from media to so end of month one. We had 30 people on board across Bombay, Delhi, and Bangalore, and we started all the three offices in the first month itself. And uh, and again, you know, to the point, uh, all of them were known to us. So uh, yes, it was definitely easy because you know all these entities, all these people, all you know, all, all friends, all of them, we kind of known to us. We kind of we knew each other. At a personal level, and that kind of really helped. Yeah, you know, in fact, that was going to be my next question. You know, after the first, the first five of you, how did you really build the business in terms of building the team? Apart from you five, how do you get the clients? I was going to ask you that question, but you said that virtually everybody migrated from media turf. Uh, yeah, so I, mean, just, I don't know if you can ask me if I can ask you this question. If it's not controversial, I mean, didn't media turf or Euro RSTG object or something? So Euro was not in the picture at all. I mean, they were investors, I guess, but they were not in the in the picture. So people just quit, right? And they joined us. So in invest, one of them just told uh, uh, told me that that he going to join, you know, interactive avenues. That's it. I mean, so they just quit and they joined us. We were lucky, I guess. I mean, you know, and I I'm very really thankful to a whole lot of people who kind of moved at that point in time, and then a lot of them are still around. You are here or I mean, in Ad Magnet or in in interactive avenues. And a number of them actually came and said, listen, you know, we know that you, we, we've just started a couple of months. If you're not able to pay salary, that's fine. We'll manage it. You know, let's get the business rolling. So uh, even 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 the, the early employees seem to have a kind of, you know, um, um, an ownership in the business. And that was kind of really great because the kind of effort they put in to get the business growing, it, it's not just about us as the co-founders. It's about the founding employees. I'm not, I mean, and I'm not saying employees now don't work. They, they, they all do it. But the founding employees at that point in time, I put in a lot of effort. They actually helped us. Okay. Did you, uh, you know, to get this thing, uh, what should I say, lubricated, moving along smoothly? Did you also think of uh, ESOPs or you know uh, stakes yeah. for the founding employees we as well? Both. We have ESOPs. We have ESOPs at uh, at Interactive Avenues. We have ESOPs at Ad Magnet also, and that's part of the deal. We have that. We've been having that um, right from the beginning. Oh, great. And you know, in the early part, it takes you roughly, typically a business takes roughly two to three years to kind of break even and chug along in a smooth fashion. Did that? How did it pan out for you the early two years, you know? Well, I guess our first break even month was, if I'm not mistaken, month five or six. And by okay. month and <laughs> and by month 15, we cleaned up all our past <laughs> losses. So interactive avenues was completely profitable from month 16 onwards and stuff. So, although of course Ad Magnet is still to kind of you know uh, while we are on a on an operating uh, profit, we've got past losses to clear up. So Ad Magnet is still there, but on interactive avenues, we've been doing that uh, for a long time, and and we soon grew, grew to be. Of course, there are no numbers to prove it. But I guess interactive avenues is the largest digital agency in the country. And uh, you know, of course, to be the largest agency, you should be profitable, right? It doesn't make sense to run a business where you're not profitable. Okay. Now, any key course corrections you had to make in the initial period? Changes in the model? Changes in the proposition to customers? Well, uh, not too much. Not too much, except you know, um, as I said earlier, 
uh, in the first uh, couple of months, uh, the, the, let's say the first six months, we had a we had a business plan. Say these are the clients that are going to move to us. I mean, this seemed easy, right? So coming back to earlier things, seeing people we know, there were some people we knew very well. We still have a drink with them, whatever else. But unfortunately, the, the business didn't move for for a variety of reasons. So you know, about month three, we said, listen, Mars, we were thinking these guys will move. They've not moved. Uh, we need to do stuff. We need to figure out life. Otherwise, you know, <laughs> you won't get business. On the other hand, suddenly we started clients who we didn't even expect to move. We're kind of calling and saying, why don't you come for a pitch, and or or why don't you handle our business, and so on and so forth. So so kind of it was offset. But then we had to do that those kind of stuff, right? No, now not chase after this client. These things are not happening. So let's chase after the others. Let's not keep chasing people who do not who seem to be hesitant to move. So those were bit some bit of stuff that we need to do. Otherwise, not too many course corrections. Okay, now if you you know if you look at the next stage of your growth, where you suddenly said, I think we are now approaching maybe you know the takeoff or you finish takeoff, you're now getting into really growth and an acceleration stage. Your first client was uh, Travel Guru, I understand, Ashwin right. Damera, the CEO. Uh, yeah. He is the one who introduced you to uh, Sequoia. That's and right. uh, you know you decided to not just raise one but three rounds of uh, capital through Sequoia. Well, it's not. What, not exactly one, what made you realize that you needed significant step up in the money? And secondly, you know, as a follow-up question, is what made this relationship with Sequoia so special? One, it 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 wasn't three. It was actually you know uh, I put maybe two or one and a half. Where where some money we took it off uh, a deferred kind of stuff. We took some money in the in the beginning and said okay, we'll take it later. Kind of stuff. So it wasn't exactly three rounds in that manner. It was. It is actually just an extended first round, so to say. It wasn't three rounds. So uh, going back to the Sequoia question is is a you know um, I think we first met um, Sandeep and Shailendra uh, from Sequoia, and while we had the money uh, you know called our investment from Anupam, and we could have technically run with most of that as far as interest revenues is concerned. We did spend some of the money in ad managed subsequently, uh, but. So you know we we were fine with money. We didn't need too much of money there, but you know what kind of got us to talk to or or kind of get Sequoia or kind of get Sequoia to invest in us is what we figured out is a name like Sequoia is is a good name to have as the backing, right? I mean, if you if you want to go to some place and you are telling you okay, what's your particular you, a you're a new company, just tell them you know oh, we invested by Sequoia Capital. I mean that suddenly the guy kind of looks, looks at you much more seriously than he would have otherwise. Right? I mean, otherwise he would somebody who didn't know you would just say, "Okay, oh, this is Johnny come lately. They just started something on their own and they think they can handle my business." Now on the other hand, you tell them, "Was we we are funded by Sequoia Capital?" The guy kind of looks at you very seriously. I mean, Sequoia wouldn't be investing in some some uh, you know stupid kind of a business kind of stuff. So so a one it was it was something which added to the weight we had as a business proposition. Two, they were able to um, get us. A lot. Of, I mean, they were able to open a lot of doors for us. They were able to get us introduced to a, a variety of companies, which is a part of the portfolio, large companies, which so where we could have a business relationship with them. So, so that kind of helped. I mean, having Sequoia on board was really very helpful. We were we were introduced to a lot of the U.S. companies, and we did a lot of work with them. And I, t and needless to say, you know, we, we got better terms because we were so-called, you know, same investor kind of investing in us and stuff. So. So all in all, it is a good thing to get Sequoia on board, and uh, they've been very helpful. So now it's no longer Sequoia, right? I mean, now our, our I mean, if you know, it's, it's Westbridge actually who's put the money, and it came from the Westbridge fund. Um, so after the split, I mean, it's kind of Westbridge, but 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 both from Sequoia and Westbridge, we've always had great support, completely non-interfering. They let us, they let us run the business. They gave their advice, and they said, you know, this is what we think. Now we leave it to you, and 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 they let us run the business. Uh, so you know, as against a lot of stuff I read about, where people, I mean, I, I don't know personally, but where people keep cribbing about, you know, the VC did this and the VC did that. I don't think we've got much to complain. I mean, we from your happy. point of view, sorry, from your point of view, therefore, uh, your decision to get funded appears to be more strategic than driven by real financial needs. Is, That's am right. I right in saying that? That's right. Perfectly right. Okay, and would you say that this is how, in your view, entrepreneurs should really look at fundraising more, not just for the sake of money, but more for driving business uh, objectives? 
Uh, see, see, yes, and no, see, you you will need money at some point in time unless you're already capitalized yourself and you're going to you, you have fair amount of spare cash to kind of run the business. So let, let's say you know um, again, Anupam was also a person who's interested and therefore it kind of and our wavelengths match and those things kind of fine. But at that point in time, we definitely needed the money, right? But at the Sequoia's time, I said maybe we might need some money. We we didn't need the kind of stuff we we we. we we took on board, uh, but it, it, therefore, in that sense, it's more strategic. So the way, way I look at it, or the way we look at it is, you know, for us, uh, we are very clear that never take more than what you want or what you need. So it's it's kind of sometimes very comforting. Say, you know, let me pick up more money. There's money available in the market, but what we've seen is that if you've got or or or, 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 or our outlook is if you if you become too comfortable in business, you might just Miss the bus. You might not just worries. So the moment you, you've got just enough to be, you know, you you know, okay, I need to work. You will you will continue working. Otherwise, you might just you know re relax and you kind of miss the bus. So we 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 never took more money that said we needed. We took money only when we we needed. And the way I look at it is, there could be. I mean, of course, it may be different for different businesses. But in our case, there could be a tendency to kind of take more money, splurge, and all that. We were very cautious about doing that, and we never did that kind of stuff. So for us, you know, scale while it's important, profitability was also important. So, so the that's the way we ran the business, and therefore for us, uh, there was no need. We would never take more money than we needed. Okay, Ratish. One thing I've seen, you know, is that uh, uh, when you take money from an outside investor, whether it's an individual or whether it's a, an institutional investor. Uh, the dynamic in some sense changes you know when you have a bunch of people like you have four other co-founders where a little chummy and when you have an outside investor did you feel that the dynamic in terms of reporting in terms of internal governance changed you know because of this external investor no nothing much except we had to you know pay our auditors more because Sequoia what were the big four to be the auditors so we had to pay, pay more for the auditors other than that uh, there wasn't too much of a hassle. They came, of course. They, you know, it is good that they came, so they helped us put together maybe a lot of corporate governance things which we as individuals did not know about. So in that sense, I think it was maybe good that you know we had an investor, and then maybe because they did a due diligence, okay, this is missing, this is missing, and therefore we kind of put all that in place. But did they really change the way we operated or or the way we ran our business? They did not. They were kind of more supportive than uh, you know uh, being at loggerheads kind of stuff. So they were very supportive of what we did. So we didn't oh, have to. Great. Okay. Now, uh, if you were to look back at the interactive avenues, uh, you know, early and later stage, what are the three things you would say that you did, you know, fantastically right? Of great, you know, you did a fantastic job. Um. Well, I know what. There were two things I can think definitely. One is, of uh, an interactive avenues, we were always client focused. So, uh, you know. Uh, if a client has a requirement, we work towards that. So, so we kind of aligned our our way of operating with what a client wanted. So, so therefore we were in sync, and then for we had a lot of clients who were happy with us. So, one was client focus. Two is the other thing. What we what what, what we were always clear is that you know advertising is a very very manpower or people intensive thing, and therefore we need to take care of our people. So the other thing that we did is 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 we tried to the extent to possible to take good care of all the people who work with us, whether they were our founding employees or they came on later. And we had a very you know um, uh, an employee friendly uh, atmosphere to the extent that you know we used to have at least we did for the first five years where uh, we used to have an annual uh, outing for the entire entire company. It, it is not about a department or whatever else, and and some of them were team building exercises and stuff like that for the entire company. So two things that we we did right, I think, and we we were focused on was client delight and taking care of uh, the people within the company. And looking back again, you know, what are the couple of things that you might have done very differently if you had a chance to go back? Mm. Well, um, I don't know. <laughs> At this point in time, I can't think of too many things that are done differently, maybe. Uh, except, if you, from, <laughs> no, if you look at today's point of view, maybe yes, uh, uh, a far uh, 
or maybe a larger use of technology in, in, in some of the areas or automation in some of the areas. But other than that, um, I don't know, not, not too much. Having said that, you know, uh, you could have rewind back to the early dot com days. I would have definitely said, you know, let's not do cost per performance kind of deals and then hope people spend on branding. But then that's wishful thing and that's an industry level thing and that's not an interactive revenue level thing and stuff. So not too much. I mean, I, th I think uh, more or less, I think we did most of right. I mean, luckily for us, we, we did most of right. So it looks like you kind of went down the right avenues, you know. And when you came, when you went down all these avenues, what made you finally look at the avenue of exit, Ratish? You know, so, yeah. what was so, the trigger? A of, yeah, a couple of things. Um, see, there was a lot of maybe you know, let's put it this way, there was a lot of inbound interest from the large advertising uh, groups, and um, you know, although it was happening for quite some time earlier, also that year, particularly I think around end of 2011. Sorry, 2013. So early 2012 and 2011 kind of stuff. Inbound interest had reached quite high. I mean, everybody seemed interested in talking to us, saying, "What are your plans? And what do you want to do next?" And so on and so forth. So we said, you know, uh, here are a bunch of guys who seemed interested. Instead of kind of doing one-off thing with somebody else, let's kind of do one. Let's do a thing. Let's run a process. See what their interest levels are. See what's the kind of valuation that they're willing to pay us. Uh, for the company and what are the other terms and conditions and let's see if there's an exit possible because um, the the thing is that you know the couple of things one is when you're there are two things one when you're part of a larger uh, a group you know the chances of your access to a lot of other stuff to other markets to 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 knowledge uh, to all lot of stuff will be much higher rather than being a standalone in a company in a country like India so and when and here you are not uh, the suitor, the other guys who are kind of wooing you. So it 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 makes more sense to kind of agree at that point in time. And we thought the time was ripe, uh, right? Because you have we had so many suitors. So we said let's go ahead and see what happens. So we ran a process, and uh, it took some time, but finally we boiled down. I mean we we kind of uh, it it came down to IPG, and then we we signed up with IPG, and they they bought us out. When you said you ran a process, you know, having gone through something similar myself, did you use an external advisor of some sort, you know, where you so felt we had, we had better an, equipped? We had an external advisor, uh, at least to run the process, although most of the decision was taken internally, but to run the process, to get people on the table, to see what should be done. Uh, so we had an external advisor to do that. Okay. And, it, and uh, you know, it, help, it did help because, you know, um, like in some of these cases, I think, an investment banker is best suited to run that kind of stuff rather than, uh, you know, uh, the, the the business people themselves, right? So, no, I have this feeling, you know, many times, um, you know, the way, if you take a traditional Indian marriage, I'm not saying all Indian marriages yeah. are like this. The bride <laughs> and the groom never discuss dowry because if if it works <laughs> out, they have to sleep in bed together. Yeah. So here, here, well, let's say, let's put it this way. Uh, the external uh, facilitator was was more to bring the bride. I mean, bring the bride in front of the groom, or or get the so-called swamara in place in this case kind of stuff. And then we discussed between ourselves what the terms and conditions and stuff like that. So, so slightly different from the traditional Indian marriage, so to say that. Yeah. No, no, I know that. So, I mean, can you just walk us through what happened between the co-founders and key employees? You know what? Have, what were the dynamics and what were the communication that happened? Because this is tricky sometimes, right? right. Sometimes people right. think you're, you know, you were running away from the business kind of thing. No, so you know the way it, way it happened is, um, so we, you know, we had a we we had a process where the and 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 right from the from from up front, ad magnet was kept separate, price separate. This is only for the agency business interactive avenues. And we we actually uh, met the various advertising groups and we presented to them and they came back with their offers. We shortlisted some of them, went into a second round. There was due diligence and so on and so forth. They came back with a revised bid, and finally, kind of, we accepted one of them, which was which is kind of IPG. And at that point in time, once we kind of closed everything and everything was ready, uh, I think so. At Magnet, there was nothing much to do except that the, you know they were, um, uh, because we are a separate company. So Amrit Interactive News had a word with the entire team and said, you know, this is what's happening. 
In fact, prior to that, he had spoken to all the departmental heads and said, you know, this is what's happening. We are looking at this. We'll keep you guys posted. And this is, and he got back to the team saying, this is what's happening, and this is all we've done. And um, uh, we, we, we signed uh, everything up, but till the money comes to the bank, we don't know what's happening. So, you know, you guys keep it yourself, and this is what uh, happened. And most guys took it fairly, uh, very, very well. And, you know, even the employees were benefiting because their e-shops were also technically getting in cash. So, you know, people did make money out of the transaction. So they knew, most people knew what was happening. We were kind of kind of uh, open with, with most of them and saying, you know, this is what we're doing. This is what's happening. And why are we doing this? And, and so on and so forth. So people were in it. Great. And how much was, uh, you know, you had already had an investor for six years. Was there any pressure from any external party, you know, to hasten this process not of all. exit? Not at so all. It not was at completely all. They were perfectly Go fine. Ahead. They said, you know, we leave it to you to run the business. You know, we are not in a hurry to exit. We, you know, and if, you know, we agree with your uh, principle that if, if the valuation is right, then we'll exit. So we never had any pressure. And that, I think, is, is one of the, uh, you know, few lucky things that we, we, we've had. Uh, where we didn't have any pressure. That's right. Um, now, having gone through this experience now of building a company, scaling it up, and then an exit process, mm -hmm. what are your key learnings and what advice would you give to others, uh, other entrepreneurs, you know, key lessons? So, um, okay, one is, you know, uh, the way we look at it is, uh, you know, have a clear business model in mind. It can't just be an idea and, okay, we'll, we'll figure out as we go. So a clear way of, of how to make revenue. And one of the things that we were very, very uh, particular about is from day one, I mean, you might be a loss-making company or whatever else in day one, but you're kind of very clear that we need to make profits sooner than later, okay? And it should be sooner than later. And uh, therefore, we kind of work towards that. So um, one of the things that we've done, uh, we've done and I think... Uh, which, which I kind of keep telling people is like, put your head down and, and work, and that's kind of really paid dividends for us, right? I mean, we didn't bother too much about what others were saying, what's happening in the market and all that. We said, okay, this is what we need to do, this is how we make money, and therefore let's, let's just go ahead and, and, and do that. And as I said earlier, the two things which worked for us, and I'm repeating it here maybe, is complete a focus on, on our client needs. So in this case, our clients were the advertisers. So I would pull it for any business. So if you are, if, if, if somebody is an entrepreneur, a TG or his clientele is, is, is whatever, as long as focus is there for the clientele, it's definitely going to, going to work. And two is you need to take care of uh, your own people, your partners, and so on and so forth. So it's not, you know, you just can't, uh, do without a certain part of the ecosystem uh, supporting you. So therefore, one needs to kind of, you know, be completely, um, you know, um, or you should, one needs to take care of internal uh, people, your partners, and so on and so forth. Only then will you get to where you're going. In, in our case, one of the things that I can kind of missed out is, is is we had a lot of goodwill, and that's kind of one of the things I thank everybody for. And I think one of the key things for our success. Right? I mean, we had goodwill both from clients, from publishers, from our internal, I mean, the people we recruited. So a lot of goodwill was there, and that's kind of really helped us. You know, I mean, for a fledgling company starting off on day one, you know, we got we got credit from almost all the publishers and everything. And so that, so so I think, you know, once you start, once you have a goodwill, when you create a goodwill, it's really going to help you. And that is, is, is something we've learned um, so what you're Obviously. saying, Ratish, is to, to get something tangible in terms of, say, wealth or money. Uh, in your case, a lot of intangibles seem to have contributed to it. There is definitely. I mean, so it's, it's a mixture of tangible and intangible stuff, right? I mean, you know, everything can't be... <laughs> so it's not all are not black and white and, and neither is it completely gray. It is, it is somewhere in between. So there is a fair amount of nice colors there also. So it's, it's not so dark. Black or white or some gray in between. Nice bright colors also, and and that's what really works. And and you know, and and the other thing that you see is as long as uh, you know your partners and your, your your clients and your employees, they're all happy. I think you'll be happy. And 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 that's a that's a key mantra that we keep putting there. You know, your client should be happy. So that's that's a completely external piece. And your your employees should be happy. Completely internal. In between, you you have various partners. Now you keep all three parties happy. You have to be happy, unless of course you are you know you are, you are born sad or something like that. You'll definitely be happy also. And and so and you know, it. Ratish, in in your case, they did one of you kind of take the lead in driving this exit process and. 
Uh, yeah, how so, long you know, did this whole process take? Right. So technically, you know, in in, in the entire exit, Amar and Shantanu uh, are are you know are part of the business and they they run that and they are still running that as per you know as an IPG company. So uh, the lead was taken by Amar in this case, and he um, he did most of the stuff for the the exit. Oh, great. So uh, now, if you look at the deal, that means you and the others, the other three too. Uh, don't have to be part of interactive avenues anymore. Is that part of the deal? No, no, no. so we're not. We're not part of interactive avenues. So Sunil okay. and me are out of interactive avenues. Anjali runs the price. So Shantanu and Amar, who are part of interactive avenues, the other three, we are. We're not part of interactive avenues. Okay. Now you know. Final reflection before I close this out. Any time you know your first generation entrepreneur coming from a small town, your father a classic migrant to another place and all that. Any time when you felt uh, this. This entrepreneurship thing was really not worth it. You should have actually stayed put in your old job. Well, maybe one odd time, maybe one which I wouldn't remember. Otherwise, most of the time, no. Well, you're and lucky. I, okay. Yeah. And, and, I, think, and, I think and you're lucky. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess. I, I guess I'm lucky. And, and I had complete support. Like, you know, before we started off, I told my parents, you know, I'm doing this. So my dad said, she, you know, you know best. You know, I don't know what he, what he did and stuff like that. So you, if you know best and you think it's going to worth it, do it. My wife said, you know, give it a shot. What's the harm? It's you know, 16 hours. Uh, it can, I mean, so things will only go uh, grow better. So I had complete support from family, uh, and as I said, I had support from. He had support from our. Our, our partners, our, our advertisers, the employees, and all that. So, end of the day, yes. If you ask me, we were are, are we lucky? I think we are very extremely lucky. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So, you know, if somebody says it's only hard work, I said no. There is a bit of luck also. Of course, hard work is definitely there, but that that small bit of luck can kind of chase things one way or the other. And I think we we were really lucky. And I kind of thank everybody and thank God for it also. So. <laughs> Okay. Now, one thing which happens to an entrepreneur, you know, it's not just a, as they use as, as the old saw goes. Uh, you know, it is not just a career change, but it's a lifestyle change, and right. uh, a lot of things change. Work-life balance and all changes. Did it happen to you, and how did it kind of uh, affect you? And well, how did you manage uh, it? Yeah, maybe the, the the early days, maybe the first uh, the first couple of years, maybe yes, um, to some extent, but but. Earlier also, you know, given that advertising overall is such a, you know, <laughs> the way the way the industry works, and you work late, and all that kind of stuff happens. So maybe may not be too much, but it definitely did make a difference in the early days, where you know you were working Saturdays, sometimes Sundays. Uh, you did a lot of work which you never did in the earlier stuff. You know, like for example, somebody would sit and go through, you know, various. Uh, when we move to an office, so one of us would sit and go through the plans and say, you know, okay, this is where the cabin should be, this is where people should sit. We could have never bothered about all that in our earlier job. Yeah, they, 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 you know, somebody else would take care of all that. So maybe some there was in the maybe the, the early couple of days, there was a bit of uh, maybe stress in the family, in the sense that you did not get to spend as much time with the family and so on and so forth. But that kind of increasingly became lesser by year three and four, you kind of normalized uh, your lifestyle and then kind of got back into, you know, a normal or a much more normal lifestyle in the first couple of years, and yeah, the first couple now, of years may have been slightly off balance uh, in in terms of you know uh, not being able to give as much uh, to the family, but uh, subsequently you know you did manage to kind of balance it out. Good, and now Ratish, you know now that you've got uh, out of uh, interactive avenues completely, what's next apart from Ad Magnet which you're running? Any other plans that you have? Any now that you have money, I'm sure that uh, a lot of people will be interested in knowing you, uh, it, it, like how they you got to know Anupam Mittal. Any plans of making your own angel investment? Yeah, so as of now, we are we are completely focused on growing Ad Magnet, and that's and and that's the complete focus at this point in time to take Ad Magnet to figure out uh, what is next for Ad Magnet. The Ad Network is not a easy space to be in at this point in time. Uh, so therefore, what next? What do we do, and and what's our way forward? So that is very key. As, as far as becoming an angel or whatever else, haven't bothered to think about it. But right now, we kind of focus purely on taking ad magnet to the next level and see how we can make this a much larger business than what we are today. So, so you know, like your family, your wife, and all are happy that you're again starting something new, or are they looking at you with great trepidation? 
No, I mean, it's fine, right? Admin has been there for now, what, almost five years, right? Four and a half years. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the same, so it's fine. And, 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 you know, I'm like, again, as I said, you're, you're luckier than I am. I'm personally lucky that I have a, a family who's completely supportive of what I do. So we have no, I, I, I have no, uh, except my, my daughter once in a while tells me, you know, I don't, uh, today why don't you take a day off? And that's because she you know I can't, I have to go to office. <laughs> but that's like, once in a while, so that's fine. But other than that, you know, uh, the family is completely supportive of what I do, and it's been about four and a half years now with Ad Magnet, and so there's nothing, nothing new for them. Any last pearls of wisdom for an aspiring entrepreneur, Radish? Um. Okay, as I said, you know, very, very simply, one of the things is, you know, when you figure out what to do, just put your head down and work, and success will definitely be there. Having said that. You know, it's it's not just about an idea, but about a business which you think can have traction. You know, I've seen a number of people who say, you know, what I'm doing is different from the others, and that sometimes is scary to me, right? You know, uh, because everybody wants to come and say my product is better than somebody else's product. I remember in the early days, you know, somebody asked me, how are you different from the other agency? I said, I said, you know, the 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 uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Why don't you try me out? You I know, mean, I can tell you a number of things, but then I shouldn't be telling you how I am better. I'll, I'll only keep saying why I am better. Right? I will not say why I am bad. I mean, because I'm in the business. So why don't you try me out? I'm going to tell you. So one is, I said, you know, we need to believe in ourselves, but we should not kind of get uh, uh, overtaken by the hype that something happens. I mean, for example, a lot of ad tech companies have kind of come up, and you know, say, okay, I am better than this guy. I am better than that guy. I mean, you've done a great product, maybe, but but do you see the scope? Do you see the scale? All that. So so that's one thing I would say. You know, we should have our 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 feet uh, grounded to reality. At the same time, not be mundane. I mean, you should look at ways of maybe jumping and and taking the next big jump. But with your feet firm, uh, no, no, uh, firmly grounded. So that's one. The other thing I, I I like to tell people is never take money more than what they want. Because once you get into a comfort area, I think that's a sure shot recipe for disaster. You've got too much money, you may do things which are not what your core, what you what you started off by doing, and then you may just get completely off your head and you're in your comfort zone. And uh, last but not the least, you know, completely focused on your target audience and take care of your people. Ratish, it's been fantastic talking to a first-gen entrepreneur and somebody who's made a mark in a new emerging interactive uh, digital marketing services space. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak to us, Ratish, and all the very best to you for Ad Magnet and anything else. Thank you very much. Thank you, and it was great speaking to you too.